Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 16th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular weekly segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discussed the Permanent Fund Board's proposal to change the structure of the Permanent Fund. To us, it represents the completion of a triple play. First, the legislature came for savings, then they came for the PFD, and now they're coming for the Permanent Fund Corpus. We oppose it and we explain why. Second, we explain why we are increasingly frustrated from a fiscal perspective with the direction in which ADA, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority is headed. And third, using an approach developed at the federal budget level, we examine another way to evaluate North Slope oil tax credits, or what would be called at the federal level tax expenditures. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get cracking um, <clears throat> and uh, start talking about this. Yesterday, I had a, a my own kind of little deep dive analysis, and that's where we're going to start today in number one, which is the permanent fund um, and the permanent fund corporation playing right into the hands or actually working, I guess I would say almost in lockstep with some of the powers that be, including Bert Stedman, in trying to take advantage of a manufactured crisis. Uh, and that, of course, is this whole hand-waving freak outery over the inflation proofing in the fund and how it's just not been done the right way or there's not enough and and how the permanent fund's going to run out of money. So we, of course, we need to have access to the corpus. And that is where we start off with number one today. It is. And, and Michael, I'm going to sort of overlap with some of what you said yesterday because I listened to it and, and enjoyed it and appreciated it. Uh, but I want to emphasize how uh, horrible uh, this scheme is that the Permanent Fund Board may be putting forth. As I, as I sent you the lead-in uh, yesterday on, uh, on things I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the lead-in is first they came for savings, then they came for the PFD, now they're coming for the PF Permanent Fund Corpus. And, and that's all this is. This is a continuation of, of what started back in the early 20-teens when they when the legislature started in on draining savings to uh, to help support spending, uh, that sort of ran its course. We ran out of savings, uh, 2016, 2017, and then they started in on the PFD, and we've seen where cutting the PFD and diverting that to uh, to government spending, and we've seen where that's gone over the last uh, several years. And now, now the concern is that's going to sort of run its course. I mean, uh, at, at even 2575, Burke's proposed, the Senate Finance Committee's proposed 25% of the of the of the POMB draw to the permanent fund dividend and 75% to government. Even that uh, isn't enough to fund uh, the projected government spending levels at the at the declining oil levels uh, by uh, by the end of the decade. So they sort of see that coming. And now, as a continuum. First, they came for, for savings, then they came for the PFD, and now they're going to come for the permanent fund corpus. As a continuum, that's that's all this is. It's setting up a rate on the permanent fund corpus. You've talked about it on the show a lot. I appreciate that. I've learned from that. Uh, but basically, um, what this is, is a setup that says, look, if our long-term real rate of return after inflation rate of return uh, is going to be in the 4% range, 
and we're paying out 5% per year of the, of the, of the permanent funds value uh, uh, to, uh, to, you know, the legislature, uh, we're, we're going to run out of money. I mean, you're going to set yourself on a course where the, the, the payments out are going to be higher than the, than the income coming in over time. And you're going to gradually drain down the permanent fund corpus. That's all this is. That's all this is. That's all this is set up to do. Um, and, and that's just, I mean, that's, that's got to be the, coming, coming for the permanent fund dividend, I think was unacceptable, but coming for the permanent fund corpus, uh, I have to, I have to think is, is crossing the line. And the fact that the permanent fund board is getting ready to propose this is just outrageous. I mean, I'm going to, this is going to be, it's building into a column that I'm going to do at some point here. Uh, in the landmine about why this permanent fund board has to go, why we have to restructure uh, the permanent fund board. The permanent fund board's sole purpose, well, two purposes. One purpose is to generate earnings uh, for, uh, uh, for whatever statutory purpose the legislature wants to put to it. And the legislature's got the PFD and the statutes have the PFD uh, and the remaining that goes to government. But their second purpose and probably the overriding purpose is to pr protect the permanent fund corpus and and they're setting up a situation in which the permanent fund corpus will be drained that's what this that's what this does so for the permanent fund board to be involved in this in this proposal for them to be the ones taking the lead in the proposal i would say is is operating against their obligations uh, as the board that they're undercutting themselves they're undercutting their own objectives they're violating their own fiduciary obligation uh, to uh, to protect the permanent fund corpus. So I, it's it's outrageous to on a number of levels. It's outrageous that that uh, that we've now got a situation where we've gone through savings, fifteen billion in savings. We've gone through savings. We're we're going through the permanent fund dividend, and now uh, we're attacking the permanent fund corpus. One other thing that I I, I want to make the point, and I know I'm not I'm not popular when I make the second point, but I but I want to make it. This is designed to protect two interests. One is government spending. They want to generate, they want to be able to continue to take the 5%, even if the real rate of return is less than 5%, they want to be able to continue to take the 5% to support government spending. But second, and I would argue a co-equal objective of this is to protect the top 20% against taxes, protect the top 20% oil industry and non-residents uh, against taxes, because what's happened at, when we've seen this with the PFD, we've seen this since 2016, 2017, when the when the PFD cuts start, what's happening is, is the top 20%, because they don't have to pay for it, they're not pushing back on spending. And so, you know, Kathy Giesel, in fact, they're even getting out in front of it. Natasha got out in front of it. Kathy Giesel's getting out in front of, you know, urging more spending for defined benefits. You see uh, uh, other Senators and representatives pushing K, increased K through 12 spending, restored university spending. Um, they are out in front of pushing for additional spending because they don't have to pay for it. They 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 have they have first used up savings. They've second you know diverted the PFD, uh, and now they're they're you know talking about using the permanent fund corpus to continue spending that they don't have to pay for. So they don't have to help put on the brakes. So it doesn't affect them. And they don't have to help put on the brakes uh, for uh, for continued spending, so that they will continue to be um, uh, protected, uh, held harmless, uh, 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 protected from from uh, from continued government spending. They don't have to bear the burden of it. So it's just, I mean, it's 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 designed to do two things. But at, at the at the end of the day, I think the permanent fund board being permanent fund board being involved in this. Uh, is just nothing short of outrageous, and uh, just nothing short of a of a of an abdication of their responsibilities as a board to protect the permanent fund corpus. You know, uh, as I look at this story, and I look at the way James Brooks wrote it, and I talked a bit about this yesterday, but they go on, you know, talking about, uh, you know, how oh, this is the inflation proofing because it wasn't done right, and we're running out of money, and everything else, and oh, but we can learn a lesson from New Mexico. Because New Mexico socked away money uh, when they had high cotton season and they did all this. And I mean, there's no discussion of one, 
the fact that over the last six years, Bert Stedman and company have socked away eight billion dollars out of the uh, right. out of out of the earnings reserve into the corpus which wasn't tagged as as inflation proofing but it effectively was a massive amount of inflation proofing the fact that the POMV formula already had inflation proofing baked into it and basically what what they failed to say here but if you read between the lines you can see it is they are spending too much based on what they have and as you said the take is too much for what the inflation proofing and everything else does. It all comes back to the fact that they have a spending problem, not a revenue problem. That's what it comes back to. And, they have and the disingenuousness of that, of saying, oh, it's all because of inflation proofing and this, and no mention of the monies that we said. And, and of course, on your chart, no mention of the fact that they're showing all the income from this year and then future expenditures, but no revenue from, from future years kind of thing. Oh, it's clearly a manufactured crisis. It's clearly... I mean, I, I don't know, maybe count three uh, of my of my column on uh, on the permanent fund board is going to be, you know, they're 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 fiddling with the accounting. They're making up the accounting in order to, to manufacture the crisis. Clearly, they're doing that of the eight billion dollars, four billion explicitly at the time that four billion was put in was for the legislative purpose of pre-funding inflation proofing. They haven't even used up that four billion yet. And then they put in another four billion. Uh, uh, which the governor tried to veto, but he crossed the wrong line or he did something wrong. And, and so that 4 billion went in there also. Um, and, and, you know, following the purpose of the first 4 billion, it should be in there for inflation proofing. We are fine. If you do the accounting right and you account for the 8 billion that's gone in there for pre-funding inflation proofing, we are fine uh, through the end of the decade. We're, we're, uh, we, we don't run out of money. Uh, unless we continue, well, we don't run out of money, um, and uh, and and we're in, and the permanent fund's in great shape. It, this is this is all because they see you know continued pressures of of uh, of spending coming or continued spending down the road. They don't want to pay for it themselves. They don't want to they don't want to burden themselves. So they're always they're just finding some other pot of money uh, to go tap savings first, PFD second, PFD cut second. Uh, and now the now the permanent fund corpus and yep it is a it is a manufactured crisis uh, if they did the accounting right it wouldn't be there but you know it's a crisis it's a crisis they're gonna <laughs> James Brooks didn't even James Brooks understands the accounting problem uh, and the accounting issue but James Brooks didn't even didn't even bother uh, to mention it because you know the work all, 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 I'm just gonna say the worst part was he mentions this eight this Mexico New Mexico. Uh, moving $8 billion in to bolster their funds. And it's exactly the same amount. That's the irony of it. He never mentions the fact that we transferred $8 billion from the ERA to the corpus. Some of it with the explicit intention of, of inflation proofing the future. He never mentions it is, I mean, it's willful blindness or it's intentional at this point. It's the, it's the same problem that we have generally with the press in the state. The press in the state goes and touches base with, in this case, the permanent fund board, uh, spokesman for, for the permanent fund board, um, and a senator who's advocating the step. They don't look for the other side. Uh, and that's an endemic problem, not only with, a, with the Alaska Beacon, but with the ADN, Juno Empire, although they sometimes do a better job at it. You know, journalism is supposed to be balanced, right? It's supposed to be, this guy said this, and then this guy on the other side said that. They never look for that. They they just they just go with whatever the press release is or whatever, you know the the leadership of the of the Senate wants them to think or leadership of the House wants them to think. They also quote Bryce. I mean it's <laughs> yeah Bryce yeah. Bryce Bryce now Bryce now seeing the end of days of the PFD cuts is now looking for the next pot of money and and uh, and and it's the and it's the permanent fund corpus. It's um I it it, it is it is absolutely the wrong thing and truly. I think that it should build into, as I talked about last week, and I talked, I'm talking about it again this week, and I'll probably talk about it in future weeks, truly should build into a concern about what's going on with the Permanent Fund Board and whether the Permanent Fund Board uh, uh, is, is complying with the, with the obligations and duties uh, uh, that it has to, to protect the Permanent Fund. It's frustrating. And the fact that every member of the permanent fund board was appointed by Governor Dunleavy starts asking, makes me ask even deeper and 
bigger questions as to what's going on. Are they complicit in this? Is there something else going on? What kind of what kind of backdoor meetings have been happening for this whole thing to to come down to this point? It's astonishing. I ended up saving this story for late yesterday, and I'm glad I did because I get so agitated when I start thinking about it and and diving into it because it is so apparent that uh, the fix is in. This is a crisis that was created by Burt Stedman and company to begin with. And now the permanent fund board has either played into their hands or is just outright complicit in this whole thing. I mean, as you read through this story about the permanent fund board uh, and their recommendations and everything they're saying, this all comes down to how much are we spending? That's what it is. We are spending too much. And so the the answer is, well, we need to do this, you know, for the and have access to the corpus, which just means it's going to continue. There's no governor on the amount of spend. They just want access to the next big pot of money. They want access to the next big pot of money that doesn't cost them anything. They want access. So so draining savings was essentially a tax on future generations. Right. We 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 took away. The, the, the safety net that had been built up for our generation. When we got to the 20 teens, we took away the safety net that had been built up for our generation. We've drained that and we're not leaving anything in the safety net for future generations. So, so when they hit the same fiscal, when they hit the, their fiscal crisis, as they will, uh, in the same way that we hit our fiscal crisis, as they hit uh, their fiscal crisis, there's going to be no safety net there. They're going to have to be, uh, uh, they're going to have to you know, tax themselves uh, to pay for it, unlike what this generation is, we got off scot free because we had we had savings. So we drained savings, so you know nobody had to no nobody had to pay for the additional sending sp- savings or the additional spending. Now that now you know by 2016 we sort of ran through that, so we needed some other funds. So they started cutting the PFD. So they didn't. So the legislature, by by far and large, the legislature and their donors and the court and the oil companies uh, didn't have to pay. Uh, for it. Yes, somebody's going to have to pay it, but it's going to, we've, we found a way to shove it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, so, you know, we don't want to stop spending. We don't want to push back on spending because we'd be the bad guys. You know, Natasha doesn't want to be the bad guy. Giesel evidently anymore doesn't want to be the bad guy. Um, uh, and we want to, we want to continue to spend, but we just don't want to pay for it. So with the PFD, they found this unique way to, to, to slough it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. And now, if you start draining the if you start draining the permanent fund corpus, uh, again, it's a tax on future generations. You're 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 taking down the ultimate savings account um, uh, in order to avoid you having to pay uh, now uh, for the costs of government that you're passing, uh, but you know sloughing it off on future generations and not now not only not leaving them a, a fiscal safety net in terms of savings. But now you're not even going to leave them, you know, much of a permanent, as much of a permanent fund uh, corpus. And so the the contributions that that they're going to get from the from the POMB draw, I mean, <laughs> the POMB draw is going to go down five percent. And if you if you take more out of the permanent fund corpus than you're putting in, the 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 balance of the corpus goes down, and five percent of that corpus keeps going down. So they're leaving they're leaving future generations with again. With less than uh, uh, with less than uh, what this gener and it's also uh, what this generation's gotten for itself, and it's also that they can continue spending, and the top twenty percent don't have to pay for it. Right. Which eventually, the irony of this whole situation is this is just a delaying tactic because eventually there will be taxes. That's the thing. I mean, eventually, as they go through, there will be taxes. Maybe not this year. If they get access to the corpus, it may be 20 years, but eventually somebody's going to have to pay. And, uh, and of course, by that time, we'll be drained of money and it won't matter. Uh, I mean, at that point, you know, I guess maybe that's what they think. I'll be dead. It won't matter 20 years from now, you know. Uh, somebody else will have to deal with the problem kind of thing. I mean, that's, that's the whole point there. It, it reminds me of a comment that Gary Stevens, uh, the president of the Senate, supposedly made at some point about, I don't care. I'm only here for four more years. I just want to get through that. I don't, you know, yeah. what happens beyond that, somebody else's burden. Exactly. Which is, this is a typical problem with the Alaska legislature. Retire, move away. Not my problem anymore. 
We're back to it. Uh, the weekly top three, number two right now, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Adia is the uh, is the uh, topic of the second of the weekly top three. Um, <laughs> Brad, um, rant away, my friend. What uh, What's going on with Adia and this whole Mustang LLC thing and all that stuff? So there was a column in uh, uh, in uh, 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 the Alaska Journal of Commerce. It was it was in the Alaska Beacon before that. James Brooks wrote about it in the Alaska Beacon, but it was republished in the Alaska Journal of Commerce from a couple of weeks ago. Um, it didn't make the top three last week, but it sort of moved up in my mind. The the the, the problems with the permanent fund board just sort of, sort of dragged Ada, Ada up in my mind along with it. And the uh, and the headline is after being bailed out by the state. North Slope oil field is uh, is targeted for sale. And this talks about one of the smaller oil fields uh, up on the slope originally developed by, I think Brooks Range was this one. Um, and Brooks Range uh, spent a lot, uh, didn't get it into production. And when production came, it wasn't very much. Uh, and somewhere along the way, uh, talked to the permanent fund or talked to ADA uh, into, I'll get back to the permanent fund about this in a second, but, but talked ADA uh, into uh, into loaning them money. Uh, the article says before the foreclosure, it, it, Brooks Range uh, subsequently went bankrupt. Um, it wasn't able to, to, you know, even with the aid alone, wasn't able to get the field up and running and generate enough revenue to pay off its costs. Uh, it ultimately went bankrupt and the aid alone went into foreclosure uh, uh, so that Ada got the, the assets that had been underlying the loan. Before the foreclosure, Ada spent $72 million developing the oil field and supporting infrastructure, not counting a special 22.5 million bridge loan from the Alaska Department of Revenue that went to uh, that went to Brooks Range. So they're a hundred billion um, dollars deep in this already, right? Budget documents show the investment bank has spent additional money. The investment bank, being Ada, has spent additional money since then to maintain the project with little to show for it. Now. Now they're getting now they're getting the point. This article is about a proposed sale uh, by Ada to a a small company called FinTech, FinTechs, I think. Um, And uh, and how, you know, Ada is pursuing that as a way of uh, uh, as a way of dealing with this asset that they had to foreclose on and spent so much money on. There's no indication, by the way, uh, in the article uh, about uh, uh, about how much they're getting paid. Uh, from uh, uh, from fintechs for uh, for the purchase, whether it's covering the the investment, even covering the investment they have in it, much less the the uh, uh, any sort of return uh, on that investment, the foregone interest that they have. Uh, no discussion about what the uh, uh, about what the terms are. There's a hint that they aren't great because uh, Randy Raro, the uh, the chief executive of Ada, is quoted as saying that they're covered by uh, the purchase is covered by a letter of credit from a bank. Um, and so they'll get paid either way, regardless of how the, the project turns out by FinTech. Well, the only time you need a letter of credit is, is in, in, a, in a situation like this is when you're getting paid in installments and you're concerned about whether or not you're going to get the future installment payments once you've handed right. over title to the asset to the other party. So it sounds like uh, they're selling this on 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 the installment plan, um, and that they're going to get paid in installments, and they've got a letter of credit to back it up uh, in the event the installments uh, don't come through. But it doesn't tell you how much the letter of credit is or how much uh, how much the dollars are. the 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 rant on this is not so much the sale. I mean, when you've got a bad asset, uh, if you can sell it rather than continue sinking money into it, you can stop the bleeding, and you can get some value out of it. Uh, before it just completely implodes, uh, that's a good thing. It's it the, the rant is about how Ada gets into these situations um, uh, in the first place, and and why it's uh, making a loan like this for uh, for a small oil field that's that's having trouble, the owner of which is already having trouble. Why it's why it's doing that uh, in the first place? It's it's propping up the market. It's propping that up that oil company because evidently the oil company couldn't couldn't get a bank loan or couldn't get it on terms that uh, that were attractive for it. So Ada came in and, and, and shortstopped that. Why? Why is Ada getting into these things in the first place? Another one that Ada is involved in is the Ambler, Ambler uh, Road, 
uh, the road out to the Ambler Mining District, 200 mile road. Uh, they've got one, there's only one mine under development on that road. It can, it can support, Ada's talking about financing that road with the cost of that road, which may be more than a billion dollars, talking about financing that road with, uh, with 30 year bonds. But the, but the, the, the project, the one mining project that's, that's, that's under development on that road only has enough for three years. So I, so there, there, it's not even close to being enough. Uh, to cover the cost that Ada is that that Ada is pushing forward to uh, to spend uh, to develop that road, they justify these things. Ada justifies these things. Oh, on well, it means jobs and economic development, and you know this. These are projects that otherwise might not lift off the ground, and we're helping out getting jobs and economic development. Well, hang on a second. Where's this money coming from? And, and it's coming, the marginal source of revenue anymore in this state is PFD cuts. And so we're taking money out of the pockets, out of the Alaska economy in terms of PFD cuts in order to give it over to, in the case of, of, the, of the, 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 the Brooks Range uh, uh, oil project, giving it over to an oil company or ultimately its creditors, uh, or we're giving it over to ADA to, to finance a road <laughs> maybe a road to nowhere uh, in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of mining development. They're they're financing these things, telling themselves these are good investments based upon prospective jobs and prospective income, a prospective Im impact on the economy. But in order to finance them, they're taking it out of PFD cuts and taking it out of things that absolutely do generate jobs and generate uh, uh, economic impact uh, uh, in the in the economy. So it's 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 taking money from middle and lower income Alaska families and putting it in these speculative projects that may or may not uh, pay out in order to finance jobs that may or may not come to exist and finance economic development that may or may not uh, come to exist. It's a bad trade. And um, and I think that Ada has really I mean, another example of Ada going overboard uh, is the Anwar leases. Ada is the was the only holder, only remaining holder of leases up in Anwar. Uh, before uh, before the Biden administration terminated uh, terminated those leases and and it's just Ada I think is sort of like the permanent fund board they're sort of losing the sense of their mission their mission isn't to go out to the bleeding edge and finance things that may or may not uh, come to pass they're sort of to you know try to try to be a good source of financing partial source of financing uh, for projects that you know have a lot of certainty to them. You ought to look at them like a banker, not like a like not like an investment banker putting a lot of speculative money out there, especially when it's not your money uh, that you're speculating with. So I, I think I think I think Ada's lost its uh, lost a sense of its mission as well. One more thing on this, and it goes back to the, goes back to the permanent fund board. Remember the permanent fund board's in-state investment program, and we've talked about it on the on the show before. Uh, and and I no doubt we'll talk about it again. But that's really what the Permanent Fund Board was trying to do. They were trying to get in the investment banking business and say, look, you know, we'll be a we'll be a source of funds for in-state Alaska developments. And and we've already got Ada doing that, in my view, doing it poorly. We don't need the Permanent Fund Board uh, uh, layering on top of that, uh, uh, going down the right. same road. So right. um, uh, we, we've got it. These boards, I think, uh, are 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 going beyond the boundaries. Permanent fund board, certainly in the case of of advocating for uh, 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 advocating for the the, the new proposal, uh, and Ada, you know, just going out for speculative, becoming the financing source for speculative projects. What's Ada's? Um, I mean, their track record's not great to begin with. Right. I mean, their track record <laughs> historically is not great to begin with. I mean, they have thrown money after so many different projects that have gone just belly up and flopped. I mean, uh, it's not it's not something that you would want to invest money in. If you were if you were investing alongside Ada, you'd be broke at this point. Yeah. Historically, with the permanent fund, you made a lot of money. But historically, with Ada, you would you wouldn't get the return. And it's uh, the one the one project they keep pointing pointing to is the DeLong Mountain Road, which uh, uh, is the is the road that runs from uh, uh, the Red Dog Mine out to the port that uh, hauls away uh, Red Dog Minerals. And Ada keeps pointing to that as that it otherwise wouldn't have happened 
It was a great investment. We're making money on it. Look how look how good that's turned out. Well, and, and so they point to that for Ambler and they also point to it for other things of, you know, we know what we're doing. Look at look at this road. Well, that road was like a 20 mile road compared to the Ambler 200 mile road. And that was to a mine that was already under development and 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 had proved its ore. Uh, one mine, not 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 depending upon a bunch of mines, but one mine that had that was under development and, and improved its ore content uh, before Ada made the investment. Otherwise, you got you know things like the like the fish processing plant in in Anchorage that's been turned into a church and and uh, uh, and and other projects that Ada has been involved in throughout the throughout the state. It, it's not a bad idea to have a small investment bank to help spur. Uh, development, but you don't. I mean, I think they've. I think they've just gone way beyond that purpose. They're they're trying to be a bigger investment bank with the Anwar leases, with the with the Ambler Road, uh, and and with this with the field up on the up on the North Slope with the Brooks Range uh, uh, field. They're trying to be a, a a big investment bank that takes takes all this risk. The thing with Goldman and the other investment banks, though, is. It's the partners taking the risk, right? I mean, it's their money on the line. They have a fiduciary responsibility to themselves and to their investors. It's not like we just got all this free money laying around. Let's try it out. Right. It's 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 there's an incentive, an economic incentive for them to be careful. Ada has no economic incentive. It's certainly not the board members' money that they're playing with. And turns out, since the middle twenty teens, when we've shifted over to PFD cuts as the marginal source, turns out it's middle and lower income Alaska families money that's that they're playing around with and they're and they're treating it they're not treating it with the respect uh in my view the respect uh, uh that they and the care that they should certainly not the respect and care that goldman and other major investment banks give uh, give to the investments they make donna says uh i wanted to try and sneak this in but we just didn't have enough time Don, donna says uh oops uh i wanted to find find it here it is State-run so-called corporations have no accounting, no administrative requirements, and no accountability. I mean, this is the crux of the problem. Like I said, I mean, I ask about the track record of ADA because how many, okay, sure, they made it in one project, the, the Red Dog Mine project. They made it in one project. How many other dozens of projects have they poured? I mean, just this Mustang uh, situation up there. It, uh, over well over a hundred million dollars invested and what are they going to get out of it 30 cents on the dollar 40 cents on the dollar that's not a return that we can live with that's not but this is what happens when you just write these guys a blank check and say go play go play go do your thing go see what you can do for alaska no accountability no accounting no administrative procedures this is where we're at right now yeah, Greg Erickson, uh, an economist uh, who understands the state very well, um, uh, goes back as long as uh, as long as uh, as uh, other economists, but back farther than other economists, uh, worked for the state for a while, understands state economics. Greg Erickson did an analysis of ADA comparing the investments made by ADA to the investments made by the permanent fund, basically saying, look, if we hadn't spent this money through ADA, we'd spend it through the permanent fund, what would have been the result? And the result would have been that we would have had more permanent fund earnings uh, that would have come back into the economy, uh, either through uh, the POMB draw or come back through the into the economy through the PFD. We would have had more permanent fund earnings, more earnings for the state, more economic activity for the state if we would have invested that money in the permanent fund than with ADA. ADA's response to that is, yeah, but we produce more jobs. Uh, and we produced more economic activity inside the state. Okay, but there's a, the, then you've just raised another question, Ada, which is what would have been the jobs uh, and what would have been the economic activity uh, if uh, if you if we if you hadn't invested and suffered these losses? Um, if uh, if we you know if that money went out through uh, through PFDs because that's what we're cutting in order to to give you money now. Uh, and there, there's been no analysis of that. Um, I can take a guess at what the answer to that would be, uh, but there's been there's been no detailed analysis of that now. But Ada right. just always falls back on, yeah, yeah, we may not make money, and yeah, yeah, we may have we may have these these blown investments, and yeah, yeah, we may lose money uh, for the state. But jobs, economic economic activity, well, subsidized jobs and subsidized economic activity 
is not really how you want to run a state. I mean, that's how you ultimately run yourself into the ground. Ask Argentina. Yeah, yeah. well, that's exactly uh, it. Which leads to another question. Amy actually emailed me this question yesterday, and I was going to ask you it, but she's posted it in the chat room. Um, and I know, <clears throat> I, I kind of know the answer to this, but she says, will Alaska go bankrupt in the next 10 years? Uh, I mean, we have a we have an eighty billion dollar permanent fund, so I don't think technically we would go bankrupt. But the pa practices that we're that we are doing right now could lead to something disastrous in the next ten years. So you think, Brad? Give me give me your take on that. Alaska won't go bankrupt in the next ten years. We may not have a permanent fund dividend uh, in the next ten years. We, they, the state may have to absorb that to avoid to continue spending and and avoid taxing you know top twenty percent for. Uh, for the for the cost of that spending, uh, we there may be various aspects of of Alaska that changes, but I don't think it'll go. Uh, I don't think it'll go bankrupt. The thing that really sort of the sleeping monster out there when you when you worry about things like that is um, is the unfunded pension obligation. Uh, the unfunded pension obligation ultimately uh, is backed up by um, uh, uh, the permanent the permanent fund corpus uh, under the Constitution. Uh, the pension obligations of the state are constitutionally protected uh, in a way that likely allows access to the permanent fund corpus to uh, to pay them off. So, and if the permanent fund corpus goes, yeah, we may be talking about bankruptcy. We're talking about significantly talking about a significantly different state. But that's not a ten-year problem. It's probably a thirty-year problem. Uh, if you add now, if you start layering on things like uh, uh, allowing a, a Doing what what uh, the permanent fund board suggesting and merging the er the earnings reserve and the corpus and allowing draws in excess of earnings uh, from the corpus. If you do that, uh, layer that onto the pension obligation. I mean, you can create and and if the economy turns south and oil prices go south and oil production goes south, you can create a scenario where you know at the 30, 25 year mark, thirty year mark, we can get to bankruptcy, but not the not the next ten years. Right, but <clears throat> definitely. There's a lot of pain driven stuff going on right now that nobody seems to be really acknowledging. And that's the that's the that's the problem here. OK, we're back. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. One final segment, the weekly top three. This is number three. Another way to look at oil taxes. Brad, you've got charts and everything, which I have up here. So give me the give me the rundown here, my friend. All right. So about the same time I started focusing on the Alaska budget, I started focusing on the federal budget uh, just to better understand where we were, the, the place we were in and the uh, and the and the types of activities were going on and, you know, how we could how we could do a better job getting getting it under control. And one of the things one of the things that that I that I got reminded of uh, as I looked at the federal budget and. Uh, it reminded me, frankly, of a set of law, law school uh, uh, lectures that I that I had when I was uh, when I was back in law school uh, was the concept of tax expenditures. And the concept of tax expenditures is that is that Congress does direct spending, certainly uh, a lot of uh, a lot of direct spending, uh, but they also do expending through the tax code. And they do that by creating these. Uh, deductions or these or these exclusions or these exceptions in the tax code that essentially allow a category of taxpayers uh, to pay less uh, than the than the standard rate than the uh, than the than the than the market price slip would would, would seem to indicate allow them to pay selected uh, uh, beneficiaries to pay less than uh, less than the uh, uh, less than the the going tax rate. And economists and, and lawyers call those tax expenditures because they are, they look at them the same as spending, the same way as any other spending, except it's just happening by allowing, uh, reducing the tax code, reducing the tax rate, and allowing that money to stay in the pocket of the of the beneficiary of the tax beneficiary, uh, as opposed to directly giving the money out of the out of the uh, uh, out of the government fund. Uh, they're just uh, reducing the government fund and allowing that money to stay in the first place um, in the hands of the taxpayers. And what in what some of the some of the organizations that look at uh, look at federal matters closely, Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, the Concord Coalition, the Pete Peterson Foundation, what those groups do is look at tax expenditures as spending and line them up as spending 
and say, look, do we really need to be doing this tax expenditure? Is it is it a better use of taxpayer money, uh, taxpayer spending than some of the other things? Or or alternately, could we reduce the tax expenditures and uh, and improve the revenue that's coming in to offset uh, offset spending levels? Uh, when you think out of it in Alaska terms, they sort of they sort of put the tax expenditures in the swoop chart. Uh, those who follow the legislature closely knows that there's a chart that legislative finance does called the swoop chart that shows the highest spending agencies down to the lowest spending agencies. That's why it gives the name the, the swoop chart. And, and it, it enables the legislature to have a view of where most of the spending is going, where various categories, where, where, what spending is going in the various categories and sort of helps target uh, where potential savings might be. So what the federal, what these federal watchdogs do uh, uh, is they take tax expenditures and put them in sort of the federal equivalent equivalent of the swoop chart, and say, look, you know, we're they may Congress may not tell you that we're spending all this money, uh, for example, on the employee health exclusion uh, benefit exclusion from the tax code. Congress may not tell you that we're spending all this money, but in fact, when you look at at the swoop chart, when we put the tax expenditures in, you can see that that's one of the biggest categories of spending. Overall, tax expenditures at the federal level level are over a trillion dollars. They're about the size of the deficit. If you wiped out the if you wiped out all the tax tax expenditures, you'd have a balanced budget. So I took that concept this, in this last Friday's column in the Landmine. I took that concept and and applied it to Alaska, and and asked you know do we have tax expenditures here and what size are they and how would they fit in the swoop chart? And the answer is yes, we do have tax expenditures. We call them indirect expenditures as opposed to tax as opposed to tax expenditures, uh, but we we do in fact have them and we do in fact uh, 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 keep track of them uh, as a result of legislation that Steve Thompson uh, introduced in the early 20 teens. One of the one of the positive things that Steve Thompson did, and so we keep track of them. And there's a report done annually by the department, semi annually, biannually, every two years by the Department of Revenue of what those tax expenditures are. And then there's an analysis done every other uh, every year by a legislative finance division of a portion of those tax expenditures to see if they're if they fit the purpose of the legislation and if they're if they're good uses of the public funds. The biggest tax expenditure are the are the credits, the per barrel credits to oil. Uh, they're about 85 or 80 percent uh, of the uh, of the overall tax expenditures. If you put them in the swoop chart, so I so I said, okay, I've done, I've identified we have tax expenditures. I've identified where they are. Let's put them in the swoop chart. If you put tax expenditures in the swoop chart, uh, tax expenditures would would be the third largest spending category, behind only K through 12 and Department of Health and Human Services. It would dwarf every other spending spending category uh, in the budget. And, and of those tax expenditures, as I said, about 80% of that is the per barrel tax credits. If you strip those out and just put those standing alone uh, in, the, in the swoop chart, they would be the third largest. <laughs> uh, standing alone, they'd be the third largest uh, uh, category of spending in, uh, in state government. So just like, just like the, it happens at the federal level, when you start questioning tax expenditures, compare them to spending or compare them to, you know, could we, could we save there? Just like we talk about saving on K through 12, or we talk about saving on, on university spending, or we talk about saving on health and, and social services spending, could we save there, reduce the, the expenditures there, uh, and reduce the deficit in the budget? Um, and, and that's a question that's not been asked. But, but by viewing them as, uh, as, a, as a tax expenditure, we raise that question. I will say this. The, the tax expenditures have been subject, uh, uh, are, are calculated uh, biannually by DOR, so you know the amount that they are. They, and they are uh, reviewed by Legislative Finance Division for whether they achieve the legislative purpose and whether they are, whether the Legislative Finance Division recommends they be continued or terminated or reconsidered or, or, or some, some categorization. The last time LA, uh, Legislative Finance Division looked at the per barrel tax credits, they said it was, they were not able to determine, it was indeterminate 
whether those credit credits were achieving the legislative purpose. The purpose at the time the credits were adopted was to, to incentivize additional production. Legislative finance said they could not tell whether in fact those credits were incentivizing additional additional production, achieving the legislative purpose. And when and when LF, when legislative finance uh, uh, commented on whether they ought to be renewed, terminated, uh, reconsidered, the classification that legislative finance put them in was reconsideration. Legislature hasn't done that. Uh, that analysis was two years ago, three years ago, by legislative finance division that they weren't that they they could not determine if they were achieving the purpose and uh, and recommended redetermination or reevaluation. Uh, the legislature uh, legislature hasn't done that. So I, I think I think we tr we like at the federal level, we really ought to be starting to look at these tax expenditures at the state level as another category of spending, allowing some people off the hook for legislative purposes, off the tax hook for legislative purposes. We ought to be looking at them as spending and comparing them uh, to uh, other spending. Natasha wanted to do that with PFDs. She wanted to consider right. them spending and compare them to other spending. Right. Well, why shouldn't we do that with uh, with tax expenditures as well? And uh, you don't have the swoop chart on your uh, on your uh, uh, post on this, but there is you do have the one chart about expenditures. And you could see in this chart that basically it uh, uh, it, you know, it equals the it equals the deficit in uh, in many ways here. Uh, and it, right. it surpasses the deficit and then equals the deficit. You could see those 17, 18, 19, that's after the major tax credits, uh, per barrel tax credits were finally uh, put to bed. Uh, but you could see that it was reigning supreme there for quite a while. Yeah, when you measure, I mean, one of the ways to measure tax expenditures at the federal level is compare them to the deficit. As I said, if you close tax expenditures at the federal level, you would wipe out the deficit. They're that large. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that from the state standpoint as well. On that chart in the blue is uh, is the debt, the size of the deficit per year, uh, which is which I calculate as being the the size that they took out of the the the, the size of the PFD cut that they diverted over uh, to balance the budget. So that's the size of the deficit that's in blue. Uh, the size of the tax expenditures, which again are largely driven by the per barrel credits, the size of the tax expenditures are in red. And and in in every year except the last except tw this is this is from the data that legislative finance and uh, Department of Revenue had so it cuts off at 2021 as their latest data does, but in every year except the last, uh, the size of the tax expenditure is outstripped uh, the size of the deficit and averaged over that period over the five years of that period, uh, tax expenditure is outstripped the size of the deficit. That means like at the federal level. If we if we eliminated the tax expenditures, uh, then uh, then the uh, the deficit would go away. I'm not I'm not suggesting uh, that you know we eliminate uh, all the tax expenditures, but we at least ought to. I mean, if they're th of that size, like spending that we that we that we now analyze on a year to year basis and decide whether or not we have enough money to spend. Like spending, we ought to be analyzing the tax expenditures. Should be part, it should be part of the discussion, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when you look at that chart, Brad, you're like, <clears throat> wow. <laughs> you're like, uh, okay, so all this deficit spending, all those per barrel tax credits, everything else, that's essentially where the majority of the spend for the PFD came from is uh, or went to, was in all those things. Uh, and in some cases, except we would have had a surplus if we had, uh, if we had not given the full Per, ba uh, per barrel tax and and the credit program and everything else um it's this is just shocking again all this ideas with other people's money whether it was adia whether it's the oil tax credits whether it's the permanent fund it's all all this other people's money we know we know what to do with this you guys just shut up and sit down we know what to do with this this is it, this is insane and, and again michael i know i i know i hammer on this point too much uh for some in the audience but again, uh, it's it's other people's money other than the top 20 percent. It's it's middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20 percent is deciding how to spend middle and lower in, uh, and mid, middle and lower income Alaska families money. Uh, and they don't have to spend any of their own per barrel credits. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All companies. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's give that money to you. Oh, it's not our money that we're giving to you. But but yeah, we'll, we'll give you yeah. we'll give you that money.
we'll 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 do that for sure. Uh, James asked an interesting question here. He says, "How does the overall tax structure compare for an oil company in Alaska versus an oil company operating in the Permian?" Well, I mean, first of all, the Permian is all privately owned land, right? I mean, that's a whole different that's a whole different deal. Um, Brad. Well, I get asked that question a lot, and, and that's really not a fair analysis. I mean, the, the 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 you really have to look at overall costs and 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 margins and and the ta- and what the tax is of the margin of the oil companies, uh, the margin uh, revenues above spending, margin of the oil companies in these different places. You can't really look at it uh, in a in a, in that sort of geographic way. Um, I would say that the that the tax uh, the tax on Alaska, when it was designed in 2013, was designed to bring up additional investment, uh, and it had the effect of doing that. And that additional investment has resulted in additional production. We were on a steep decline curve in 2013. We weren't getting uh, anywhere near a proportionate share of the investment dollars that were flowing into the industry at the time. The tax system was designed to, to increase the margins in a way that. Uh, brought additional investment into Alaska, and we achieved that. The problem is we've not looked at it since. We've not looked at it for the last 10 years. I mean, we legislators will say, oh, yeah, we sort of looked at that, but they really haven't on, on a basis that on, 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 on looking at it from the standpoint of is this necessary to maintain investment? Is the amount of a, investment we're maintaining, is that a, is that a good thing? Or is it worth the, worth the cost in terms of PFD cuts and other things uh, or not? And and I think I think the the economics of the industry overall has shifted over that time. And I and frankly, I don't think uh, I wrote a column on this at one point. I don't think that the uh, that the that, that the amount that we're giving the oil companies in terms of the tax credits is needed to maintain the level of investment that uh, that we have. Uh, I think if you look at it uh, uh, in terms of in terms of what would it be the impact on investment? What would be the impact on production if we increase the tax credits by an additional uh, or decrease the tax credits by an additional four or five dollars a barrel? Uh, I, I think you would see that the that the impact on production wouldn't be much. Um, and in fact, uh, DORs. This is before Adam Crum, but DORs uh, last look public look. Uh, at what uh, the impact of, of changing the per barrel tax credits would have. Uh, the DOR's last public look said there wouldn't be any impact uh, on production, that you could drop the, the tax credits by 4 to $5 and you wouldn't have any impact on investment levels or on production. Right. So I, 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 th- I think it's time to take, it's past time, to take another look at that uh, and, um, and look at the per barrel tax credits. I don't think, it, I don't think it's helpful to look at it compared to the Permian or compared to North Dakota or compared to compared to the UK or compared to Abu Dhabi or compared to Saudi or compared to any, any place or Indonesia or Nigeria or Angola. Um, I don't think it's really useful to do that. You have to look at what the impact is on Alaska margins, given Alaska costs, given Alaska timeframes, given, given the Alaska situation, you have to look what the impact is on margins um, uh, and see whether that, that it, it, it detracts or uh, uh, adds to uh, uh, investment and what the cost is of that of that impact. The irony, of course, is that if we eliminated the per barrel tax, we'd get getting more money from the oil companies. There you go, Harold. There you go. We get more money from the oil companies. Uh, it's something we should be doing. Uh, just another thing that we could be talking about. Um, Brad, uh, less than a minute here. Final thoughts for today. Final thoughts for today is I think the Permanent Fund Board is going way the hell overboard uh, and I think we ought to start giving serious consideration to, as we did with the Utilities Commission in the late 1990s when we sunset the Alaska Public Utilities Commission and created uh, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, just started all over and created a new board. Uh, I think we need to be considering doing that with the, with the Permanent Fund Board. And I'm going to be talking more and, more and writing about that more and more. This, yeah. this, pro- this proposal is just outrageous. Anna Adia. I mean, let's just go ahead and start talking about whether we should shutter that operation as well. hundred million dollars. Um, all right, Brad. <clears throat> well, I appreciate you coming on board. I hope you enjoy uh, the day. Are you there for a little bit longer? Is there a festival going on right now? This is my last day. I leave tomorrow. Uh, I head out uh, tomorrow. So uh, this is, I'm, I'm looking out at the, at the, at the wonderful scenery uh, uh, for the last time. And uh, I've got, I'm going to visit a few friends and then shut it down and head for the airport. 
Bittersweet, my friend, bittersweet. Well, I appreciate you uh, coming on board. Thanks for being part of it today. Michael, as always, uh, thanks for having me. I look forward to the discussions. You bet. Thanks so much for coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith Lake, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.